Hi everyone, welcome to another edition of Hub Bites. I'm Sunil Reggae, consultant psychiatrist from PsychScene. Today I'll be taking you through akathisia. Akathisia comes from the Greek word akathemi, which is never sitting down. I also understand that it is linked to kathesis, which is to sit. So essentially, akathisia in psychiatry is related to antipsychotic medication, but we'll see that some other medications also are associated with akathisia. And it can be a very, very distressing symptom to patients, and therefore it's important for clinicians to be on the lookout for akathisia and treat it effectively. So with that, let's get going. According to the DSM-5, akathisia is defined as subjective complaints of restlessness, often accompanied by observed excessive movements, such as fidgety movements of the legs, rocking from foot to foot, pacing, inability to sit or stand still, developing within a few weeks of starting or raising the dose of medication, such as a neuroleptic medication, an antipsychotic medication, a D2, a dopamine blocker, or after reducing the dosage of medication that is used to treat extrapyramidal side effects. Let's look at the clinical presentation of akathisia. We have the general. In general, what are the kind of things that we look out for? Patients described a feeling of restlessness or inattention or discomfort with special reference to the lower limbs. There is an urge to constantly move the legs and sometimes other parts of the body. Now note this word urge. The urge is really important that differentiates it from agitation. There's a difficulty or inability in maintaining a posture for several minutes. Now when a patient's sitting down, there are semi-purposeful or purposeless movements in the leg, feet, hand, arm, and or trunk. There is a tendency to repeatedly shift bodily position in the chair and an inability to remain seated for several minutes with a tendency to get up and walk or pace. When they're standing on one spot, you may see semi-purposeful or purposeless movements in the leg, feet, hand, arm, and or trunk. There is a tendency to shift weight from foot to foot or march on the spot. An inability to stand in one spot with a tendency to walk or pace. So let's look at some clinical examples. So this is an example of a patient when they're sitting down. And note what you see. You see that purposeless movement when they're sitting down. And they were specifically asked about this movement and they described it as an urge to move that was quite unpleasant. So that's akathisia. And this was related to antipsychotic medication. Now let's look at this example where the patient's standing up. And note how the patient is moving, rocking from one foot to the other. But note something else that tells me that there is dopamine blocker. Note the hand, and you may notice a Parkinsonian tremor, which indicates dopamine blockade in the nigrostriatal area, which is one of the mechanisms for akathisia as well. There are other mechanisms, which we'll come to in a bit. So what are the types of akathisia? There is acute akathisia, which develops soon after starting an antipsychotic medication or increasing its dose, or switching to a high potency medication, which means a medication that blocks dopamine receptors at a higher level. It usually lasts for less than six months and is characterized by intense dysphoria and restlessness. Next, chronic akathisia. This lasts longer than six months after the last change in medication and often includes mild dysphoria and restlessness as well as some limb and orofacial dyskinesias. So maybe associated with tardive dyskinetic type symptoms. Pseudoakathesia. This is believed to be a late stage of the chronic type. There are some motor manifestations, but there is no subjective awareness of restlessness, which is one of the key components of akathisia, the subjective compulsion to move. Tardive akathisia, which is of delayed onset, usually more than three months since a medication or dose change and is often associated with tardive 
dyskinesia. And we know that tardive dyskinesia often is seen around the orobuccal region. Withdrawal or rebound akathisia, and this can happen due to discontinuing or decreasing anticholinergic medication, which is usually prescribed to treat extrapyramidal side effects and usually occurring within about six weeks. Now, how do we differentiate akathisia from agitation? This comes up quite commonly in clinical practice. And the treatments differ, hence it's really, really important to be able to differentiate the two. We know that agitation arises from hyperactivity in the nucleus accumbens in the mesolimbic pathway, whilst akathisia occurs due to hypoactivity in that mesolimbic area because of dopamine blocking, and we'll see how that results in akathisia. But essentially, agitation is unintentional, purposeless movements, typically pacing around a room, wringing of the hands, uncontrolled tongue movement, pulling off clothing, putting it back on, and can be harmful in certain cases. Now, there is a whole body feeling of extreme arousal and a feeling of being really, really tense. Now, it's important that both akathisia and agitation are extremely distressing and can be associated with a high risk of suicide. Now, what are the medications that are associated with akathisia? It's not just antipsychotic medications that lead to akathisia. We have antiemetics such as metoclopramide, which is known to be a dopamine blocker. Antidepressants, SSRIs or SNRIs, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, or SNRIs, serotonin noradrenaline reuptake inhibitors. And the reason why this happens most likely is due to the 5-HD2A receptor activation, which we know is situated in the nigrostriatal area and the striatal area, and that can result in akathisic type symptoms. So when you do look at the video on SSRIs, psychopharmacology and mechanism of action, this is something I've covered in that. Antibiotic, such as azithromycin. Others, reserpin, alpha-methyl-dopa, diltiazem, and even pregabalin. There, is, uh, there are case reports around akathisia with pregabalin. When we come to antipsychotic medications, and this is from a recent meta-analysis, there are three key medications amongst the second generation antipsychotics. Now we know that high potency antipsychotics such as haloperidol, uh, flufenazine, flupenthixol, they're strong dopamine blocker, blockers in the nigrostriatal area and can result in akathisia. And generally it was thought that second generation antipsychotics that are D25HD2A antagonists, that the 5HD2A antagonism will minimize the risk of akathisia. That is not necessarily the case because there is a differential risk in second generation antipsychotics as well. And this meta-analysis tells us that loracidone has the highest relative risk, 2.7, followed by acenapine, which is 2.22, and aripiprazole, 1.52. And these three have a greater relative risk compared to other second generation antipsychotic medication. So when you're starting these medications, it's important to keep akathisia in mind and potentially inform the patient, but one may also need to consider short-term anti-akathisic medications uh, to be pr prescribed uh, together with these medications. Now, specifically with lorazidone, now I have covered the psychopharmacology of lorazidone as well in another video, and you may remember if you've viewed it, that lorazidone, to minimize the risk of akathisia, should be prescribed in the evening, at least half an hour after food, to minimize the risk of akathisia. And what I tend to do in clinical practice, and of course, you know, none of this is to be construed as medical advice, it is important, uh, to prescribe short-term benzodiazepine treatment if the patient is susceptible to akathisia because it's a very, very distressing symptomatology. But of course, it's something that each individual should discuss with their clinician if you're a patient that's watching it. Now, let's look at the pathophysiology of akathisia. We do know that when we think about the mesocortical pathway, the ventral tegmental area, to the mesocortical pathway, we know that antipsychotic medications block this particular pathway. We also know that antipsychotic medications block their D2 blockers and they block the dopamine pathways in the nigrostriatal area and therefore are 
associated with Parkinsonian side effects. Now, one of the mechanisms of akathisia is due to this nigrostriatal dopamine blockade. But this mesolimbic pathway seems to be playing a very, very important role, particularly the nucleus accumbens area. Now, we know that you can see the ventral tegmental area where the dopaminergic neurons arise from to the nucleus accumbens. The nucleus accumbens is a reward pathway. Now, this mesolimbic pathway is blocked by antipsychotic medications, more by first generation, less by second generation. Now, when this particular pathway is blocked, it is postulated that akathisia may result from efforts to compensate for dopaminergic activity in the nucleus accumbens. So it seems to be a compensatory mechanism due to dopamine blockade in the nucleus accumbens. That's the mesolimbic pathway. There is an additional, there are additional hypotheses. Now, the ventral striatum and the locus cerealis, where locus cerealis is the area where the noradrenergic neurons arise. Now, the ventral striatum is associated with reward processing, and, and the ventral striatum is sort of a broader area, and within it, the nucleus accumbens is situated. Now, what we do know is that dopamine blockade results in decreased activity in the ventral striatum. This decline results in compensatory enhancement of the activity of the adrenergic projections from the locus cerealis complex. So this is where you get an excess release of the adrenergic neurotransmitters, noradrenaline. Now these projections specifically stimulate the, there are two portions of the nucleus accumbens, the shell portion and the core portion of the nucleus accumbens. Now what this compensatory mechanism does is it specifically seems to stimulate the shell portion of the nucleus accumbens, thus resulting in an imbalance between the core and the shell. And this relative overstimulation of the shell nucleus accumbens area results in the typical urge to display senseless, curious or defensive behavior and is accompanied by dysphoric feelings. So this is one of the other postulated mechanisms for akathisia. Now the pathophysiology of akathisia is not just restricted to, as we saw, the locus ceruleus, ventral striatum, nucleus accumbens aspects. It seems to also involve several other neurotransmitters, dopamine, serotonin, acetylcholine, GABA, norepinephrine, which we talked about, and other neuropeptides. And this is reflected in the treatment that we'll see in a bit. Now, the neurotransmitters most specifically linked to akathisia are GABA and serotonin. GABA, mainly GABA-A receptor interactions. And we know that GABA-A potentiation tends to reduce dopaminergic activity. So GABA activity tends to either increase or decrease locomotor activity. Now, one of the other things in clinical practice that's really, really important is differentiating between akathisia and restless leg syndrome. In clinical practice, I've seen akathisia being misdiagnosed as restless leg syndrome. So how do, you do, how do we differentiate between the two? So let's look at akathisia. As you can see, the prevalence is greater, 15 to 35%, while restless leg syndrome is 3 to 9%. Now, of course, this akathisia is more likely in the context of medication. Gender prevalence, akathisia, same in both males and females, while restless leg syndrome, more in females. Motor restlessness can be absent in akathisia, whilst in restless leg syndrome, it is a core feature. So what that means is akathisia, now we saw the video where the patient was actually having motor restlessness, but in some cases, particularly when measured with the Barnes akathisia scale, so at the lower end of the spectrum, patients can simply have a subjective sense. So there's no outward motor restlessness. Paresthesia, absent in akathisia. Whilst in restless leg syndrome, it is an important symptom. And it's present mostly at night and disappears in the morning. So patients can describe things like itching in the long bones, insects crawling, cramping of the legs, and often relieved by movement. When does it occur? Akathisia, absolutely any time, sometimes all day, whilst restless leg syndrome is mostly at night time, particularly when they're saying they're going to fall asleep. Sleep disturbance with akathisia tends to be absent, while restless leg syndrome is a core feature. 
When they're lying down, akathisia somewhat is decreased, but restless leg syndrome increases when they're lying down. Myoclonus tends to be characteristically absent with akathisia, whilst with restless leg syndrome is present in severe cases. And we do know that with restless leg syndrome, often there is periodic limb movement disorder, sort of what uh, sort of used to be called nocturnal myoclonic epilepsy, uh, this sort of rhythmic jerky movements that can occur coexisting with restless leg syndrome that interferes with sleep. What's the treatment? As you can see, it's different. For akathisia, anticholinergic beta blockers, some additional things that we'll look at in a sec. But restless leg syndrome, dopamine agonists, and opiates. And I must say that for restless leg syndrome, it's important to think about magnesium deficiency, important to think about iron deficiency anemia, and treat these two conditions for restless leg syndrome. So what are the key principles for the approach to akathisia with antipsychotics? And we look at the different, in the next slide, we look at the different uh, sort of characterization, uh, breaking it down into serotonergic, dopaminergic, GABA, etc. But essentially the first thing that you can do is to reduce the dose. Secondly, if it doesn't work, then you may need to select a low risk antipsychotic or consider a switch over. Now, which are the ones that are low risk? Olanzapine, quetiapine. Now, of course, clozapine, for treatment resistant schizophrenia if they fulfill criteria. Now, some other adjunctive approaches with some promise include propranolol, 40 to 80 milligrams per day, uh, starting off low, say maybe 10 milligrams TDS initially, TDS being three times a day. 5-HD2A receptor antagonists such as mirtazapine at 15 milligrams at nighttime or ciproheptadine 8 to 16 milligrams daily. Benzodiazepines can also be utilized. Clonazepam 0.5 to 1 milligram uh, once a day, uh, particularly at nighttime. And diazepam 5 to 15 milligrams um, daily. Now these can be dosed either um, once at nighttime. They're long-acting medications, or you may prescribe them in divided doses. Now benzodiazepines, of course, one's got to consider the risk of dependence. Anticholinergics such as benztropine, one to four milligrams daily, should be used mainly for patients who have concurrent Parkinson's, uh, Parkinsonian type side effects. As you saw the video, the, the second patient, anticholinergic medications, benztropine may be more appropriate. So to divide the medications, we've got serotonin-based strategies. So meansirin, mirtazapine, these are 5-HT2A antagonists. Ciproheptadine, again, a serotonin antagonist. Zolmitriptan, a selective antagonist sorry, on 5-HT1D is another potential um, medication solution for akathisia. Dopamine-based strategies, amantadine and rapinarol. These are dopamine agonists. GABA receptors, GABA potentiators such as pregabalin and gabapentin, benzodiazepines. Now note that pregabalin was also included in one of the medications that may result in akathisia. Now these are in case reports. Having said that, it is postulated as a treatment uh, as well. Antihistamines, diphenhydramine for example, noradrenergic serotonergic input into the dopaminergic pathway. So which medications uh, modulate the noradrenergic and serotonergic input. These are beta blockers, propranolol, metoprolol, and selective alpha blockers. So alpha-2 presynaptic agonists such as clonidine are also strategies for akathisia. Now vitamin B6 pyridoxin. The important thing about pyridoxin, of course, is too much can result in peripheral neuropathy. So it's important that this is uh, dosed at the right amount. And N-acetylcysteine as well, which uh, is an antioxidant, works along sort of the anti-inflammatory uh, pathway. So let's look at some of the guidelines for antipsychotic-induced akathisia. So this is from an article in Current Neuropharmacology in 2017. And what we can see here is the first thing we want to do is either to reduce the dose or to change antipsychotic regime. And you may then switch to a low potency agent. If you're choosing a first generation, chlorpromazine might be an option. But if you're choosing a second generation agent, then we looked at olanzapine, we looked at quetiapine, but of course think about the metabolic dysfunction, clozapine for treatment resistant schizophrenia is the final step if, if that doesn't work. On the other hand, if you choose to add an anti-akathisia agent, then you've got a few options. First line options include beta blockers, as we mentioned earlier, propranolol, 40 to 80 milligrams per day, 
a 5-HT2A antagonist such as mirtazapine, meanserine is the other option. And then you've got anticholinergics, mainly if patients have concurrent Parkinsonian type symptoms. And these include, as you can see, benztropine is commonly used, 1.5 to 8 milligrams per day in divided doses. But you've also got bipyridine, you've got trihexyphenidyl um, that you can use, but commonly uh, benztropine is used. From a second line perspective, you've got options such as, first one, amantadine. Now, amantadine, 100 milligrams per day, or clonidine, which is the alpha-2 presynaptic agonist, up to 150 micrograms per day. 5-HT2A antagonist, now we looked at mirtazapine earlier, here meanserine. Now, meanserine possibly here second line because it can be associated with drops in blood counts or agranulocytosis, so possibly move towards the second line. Ciproheptadine, 8 to 60 milligrams per day. And finally, benzodiazepines, again second line, but effective agents, but can be associated with the risk of dependence. Hence, want to consider them lower down the list. As you can see, clonazepam, diazepam, long-acting agents, or lorazepam being short-acting agents can also be prescribed one to two milligrams per day. Now let's look at the algorithm by Maudsley guidelines in the latest edition. The first step is to consider reducing the dose of the current antipsychotic, as we saw earlier, or slow the rates of increase. Now if that works, brilliant, continue with that. If it doesn't, then switch to quetiapine or olanzapine, and as we said, clozapine for treatment resistant. That works, continue. If it doesn't, low-dose propranolol being the next step. Again, 30 to 80, 40 to 80, that's the range that's been recommended. Response, continue. If that doesn't work, you've got the next option of mirtazapine or meanserine. Mirtazapine, 50 milligrams, meanserine, 30 milligrams at night time. If it works, continue. If it doesn't, you've got an anti-muscarinic drug such as benztropine up to six milligrams per day. You can go higher to eight milligrams per day as well, as we saw in the previous um, guideline. Next, ciproheptadine up to 16 milligrams per day. And then finally, benzodiazepine. So very, very similar approaches. You're looking at short-acting benzodiazepines or long-acting benzodiazepines. So with the benzodiazepines, it's really important that Benzodiazepines are prescribed for the short term and consideration for withdrawal in about two to four weeks. So if you consider clonazepam, say up to a maximum of three milligrams, just ensure that it is taken away within about two to four weeks. And if that doesn't work, then you can consider clonidine. Now the dose mentioned in the guidelines is between 200 micrograms to 800 micrograms. Now one of the side effects of clonidine is a drop in blood pressure. So many patients may not be able to tolerate higher doses. Having said that, it is something that is that has been mentioned in the guidelines. Now one other thing with regards to medications such as anticholinergics, which are evidence-based in the treatment of akathisia, particularly if concurrent Parkinsonism is there, the important thing to remember is to not prescribe it over the very long term and consider withdrawal over several months or after several months. Why? Because it can increase the risk of tardive dyskinesia, these orobuccal dyskinetic movements, because the mechanism is linked to supersensitivity of dopamine receptors. So with that, I hope that you found this educational video useful, and it is important for all of us to be vigilant for akathisia, to detect it, and consider treating it. So with that, I hope to see you in another edition of Hub Bites. Take care and stay safe. Bye-bye.